I was thinking about what a modern day headline would read like for today. Present day resurrection, Easter Sunday. Uh, man crucified on Golgotha, raised from the dead, he is now alive. That would be the truth. We all know that truth doesn't necessarily get its way to the media. Uh, second one might be, man who some call Christ reported to have risen from the dead after being crucified. Chief priests mock the idea. They say he was stolen. Could be, you know, either of those headlines, I, I guess. Whatever the case, I placed myself in that position of, you know, what would I believe? Isaiah 53, one talks about who has believed our message. And that chapter is actually written to Jews because so many of them didn't believe at the time. So I think it, when I really consider it, I probably would have had a response like doubting Thomas. Remember, Jesus appeared to the disciples and then Thomas wasn't there. And they said, we saw Jesus. He was alive. And he goes, huh, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and the scars on his side, I'm not going to believe that. Somewhat skeptical. And I think that's kind of how I operate even today with some things, scenarios that, that take place. And I can just tell my thinking. Um, but here's what Jesus said to Thomas. He did show up again. And he, he went to Thomas and he said, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, you know, that's us. Those who have not yet seen, but yet believed. And so I want to pray for, I want to thank the Lord for allowing us to believe because that's how that happens. He stirs in my heart. And then those of us that are in this room, I have to believe that if you have not yet believed that he is preparing you to believe. It's pretty powerful to, to consider all that. So Father, we, we do come before you as we, we talk about this resurrection today. I pray that uh, that part of our heart that, that that questions and wonders that, it, that that faith grows as we look at your word. And I just pray that you make yourself evident and clear to us. Have your way inside of us. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. Um, I intentionally, I don't know how many times I've shared uh, the message on Easter, quite a few, I would say. Um, I intentionally don't go back and look at past messages um, because I want the Lord to speak to me something fresh. And I know it's about the resurrection. So I'm like, why do we go through? Because everybody knows when they come to, to church on Easter, what are we going to hear about? Resurrection, right? So why do we do what we do? And is there a purpose to it? And Romans tells me that there is. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. And so I pray that the word saturates our heart. And our belief grows. And our roots go deep as we hear about this powerful story. So that's why we do, I, I, my hope is, is the word be alive. Scripture talks about it being alive and active, a double-edged sword. And I pray that it is today. So we're going to look at John 20. Uh, Brian this morning, who was at the, at, the, uh, at the sunrise service, right? So he went into Luke 24. I'm going to go into John 20. Same story, different perspective. One was from Luke, obviously, and one is from, from John. So the reason I like John is that John was there. So it makes it very powerful to me. Think about it. 2,000 years ago when this morning happened, it is the most significant moment in history. The most powerful story there is to talk about. And we get the opportunity to really look at it and dissect it a little bit. Um, it changed everything, and it continues to do so. It happened in Jerusalem. You all know that. Jesus was brought before people. He was, he was scourged. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was spat upon. He was insulted. And then they ended up putting him on a cross. They took him off the cross after that process about three or so in that afternoon, and they wrapped him up. Joseph of Arimathea. He was a follower, but secretly. And Nicodemus, remember the one who asked, how can I be saved? 
And they got the body and they wrapped it in spices and they put linen around it. And Joseph had this empty tomb and they put him in this tomb. That was on Thursday, three days later. Or Friday, sorry, that was on Friday. Three days later, this is where we're at. What happens at that moment? John 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, and I've spoken about Mary Magdalene. I love the story about her because she was a demoniac at one time. And the Lord delivered her of seven demons. Powerful story there, but I'm going to go by her. Went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. Now, the other disciple is the one writing this. That's John, the one Jesus loved. He's funny. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, John was younger. Of course, he got to the tomb first. Peter was probably out of breath looking at Jonathan's back or John's back, right? He bent over and looked into the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. It's funny John didn't go in. He had a certain level of respect and he wanted Peter to be the first one, first one in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. Now he gives his perspective. He saw and he believed. That's verse 8. Now remember, that's writing about himself. So he's very privy to the emotions and the thoughts that are going on in his head. So something real happened to him in that moment. But yet there was still this spot because in the next verse it says, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So although they might have saw and kind of grasped a hold a little bit, they still didn't understand or grasp the full reality of what took place. And then it said, then the disciples went back to where they were, sta where they were staying. I'm going to come back to this, this part in, in verse 9 about them not understanding from the Scripture. Um, I, I believe something eventually, eventually tipped the scales. Right When you really genuinely and passionately believe something, something happens in your behavior and who you are. Some of us can go back to the way we were and the way we are. Well, something took place within us. And for many years, I saw, but I didn't fully grasp and understand. And that's where John and Peter kind of were. They were in this place where, man, they're seeing it. And try, all their thoughts were coming together and they're wondering what happened and where is he? But yet I do, I see it. What's going on? This challenging situation. And I feel like I would be right there. Like uh, it was the guy that brought, uh, um, I believe it was his son or daughter. I can't remember, but he basically, um, they were filled with the spirit and he brought the, the, his, his child to Jesus. And basically Jesus said, do you believe? He said, Oh, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. That's kind of where they were. And it's kind of where I would be in that moment. Like, Lord, I believe. Oh, help me with my unbelief. It's not so ironic. John clarifies his purpose. If you go a little further down, this is John 20. He appears to Mary Magdalene. He appears to Thomas. And then right after that appearance of Thomas, it gives the purpose of John's gospel. It says this, John, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I mean, John, the author, going through the story, stops for a moment and say, look, this is why I wrote the book. I'm going over these things to tell you and hopefully that you will believe. And by believing, you will have life in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ. I mean, he's laying it out and he's saying, yeah, we were struggling. We were going through it. Jesus was showing up and we're questioning it. And look, this is why I wrote this thing for you. So you believe it. <clears throat> Tells another story. <laughs> Go back to John 11. One of my favorite stories. I'm not going to hit it for due to time. And I don't want to take away from this story. But when he raised Lazarus, you all know that story. He shows up at Mary and Martha's. The brother had died, been dead four days. And he says, to Martha, I'm going to raise him up and have this interchanging thing before he actually does it. And she says, I believe that you're the Messiah. 
and I believe you can do this, right? They had this conversation. And then verses 25, 26, he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever believes by believing or lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that's the question that we keep coming around to at various moments in our walk or initially when we're deciding whether or not we're sorting this out between us. And I hear the story and I see it, but do I believe this? I had the guys in staff training this week do a journal question. Do you really believe what you say that you believe? Because if you really believe what you say that you believe, your life changes just like Peter's and John's did. Who has believed our message? Peter believed for sure. And it's evident. I want to spend most of our focus on him today because he was the first to the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene didn't go in. She knew that there was an emptiness, right? She went running for him. He shows up, him and John, just as I went through. He's the one in the tomb. And then what happens with him in that experience? What happened to his belief system? Because it's evident if that changes, lives change and how people act change. We have to remember that he denied Jesus three times. So he's going through it, right? He's trying to get himself together. And he actually went back fishing. Now, if I flip a page and we're the disciples, they're fishing one night. They're out in the water and they don't catch anything all night long. And they're heading back to shore. And Jesus now again appearing, I think, for the third time to him. He says, hey, guy from the shore, throw your net on the other side of the boat. So they went ahead and did it. They throw their net on the other side of the boat. They haul in a whole load of fish. Matter of fact, it specifies the number. I didn't, di- I didn't dig into this. 153 fish. And they lug them up into the shore. He says, come on. Builds a fire. And they cook the fish. And they eat together. Jesus, after the crucifixion, after the burial, after the empty tomb, hanging out with his disciples. Pretty cool story. John 21, 15 and 19. Now remember, this, this situation takes place with he and Peter after the denial, and he told him that he would deny him. He said, oh, I won't deny you. And then he denied him. So then they have this interaction together, and they'd finished eating. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, do you love me? You love me more than these. Some people say he's pointing at the boats. Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, do you love me? Simon was getting a little hurt. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Then he said, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress out, will, will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. And follow him he did. And the verse right before that one that says someone will dress you and you'll lead you where you don't want to go. He followed him all the way unto a crucif- to being crucified himself. And because he felt unworthy to be crucified like Christ, he asked that he, was, he would be crucified upside down. That's a follower. <clears throat> he saw, he believed, and he eventually understood. I've considered, I've considered this. You know, my life has, has changed drastically, but yet I still have a long ways to go. And it correlates, it's parallel, totally parallels with my belief system. So what I believe about this story and about this person of Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and how He infiltrates hearts and He breathes and makes things come alive in each given moment, I walk accordingly to that belief. And I inhibit that as well because of my lack of belief. Very frustrating. I'm the problem. My life will reflect who I believe to be the truth. Peter's life does for sure. You got to remember the one time uh, Jesus told him, you're Cephas. 
you're the rock on which I'm going to build my church. And he was prophesying to him. He knew the story. He knew how he was going to use him. And so well, what did he actually believe? And so let's find out because so after this little event, Jesus kind of, um, he, he, he revealed himself. And you can go through each gospel. I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit just to give you the story of Peter. But he shows up for about 40 days, right? Whether it was to the ladies or to the disciples and they had, they had the guys on Emmaus or the two guys walking down Emmaus. And he, he reveals himself and they, that they have conversations. So it's about a process of 40 days before he actually ascended. Well, through all that, something really transpired with the disciples because Peter's life drastically changed. And so from the day of resurrection, the, the, the empty tomb, until the day of Pentecost, which is in Acts 2, is about 50-day window. And Peter, the guy that denied him, something powerful. Now realize Pentecost shows up. Everybody knows that story. The Holy Spirit, it sounds like a rushing wind. He comes in. It looks like um, tongue, uh, flames of tongues on top of people. They start speaking in different languages. People can identify those languages like, whoa, what's going on here? And they had to be in the vicinity of Jerusalem because it says that there are a group of, of people from Jerusalem that are witnessing this. And they're like, whoa, what's up with these people? What's going on? Are they drunk? Have they been drinking wine? Ah, and this is where Peter steps in. This is the first sermon after Christ's resurrection, his ascension. It's the very first Easter message. And initially what he says is, no, 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 no. They're not drunk. He says this, Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully. Listen carefully to what I say. So he stops all these people around. And so what Peter truly believed begins to come out of him. He says, they're not drunk at all. And he goes into that and then he starts talking about the prophet that spoke about what was going to happen in the last days and how the spirit would show up and how the spirit would impact. But that's really not what he was getting into. He set all that up to get to the specific purpose of his message. And so I want to spend a moment looking at what was the message that came out of him. The first opportunity to speak about what he believed to be true of what just transpired, what was his message? <sighs> Let me just read it from here. Okay, verse 22. So he covers, they're, they're not drunk. And then the prophet Joel, verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Whew, he's speaking the truth. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. The first, the first message ever preached was on the resurrection. The first Easter message was right here. And then if you get really down and dirty and you want to study the scripture, look through the book of Acts, every single sermon, whether it was Peter whether it was Paul or whoever spoke in that moment, it was about the resurrection. Someone once said this, we cannot make too much of the death of Christ, but we can make too little of the resurrection of Christ. And I think I'm guilty. When I look back at, at the things that come out of my mouth, I probably do emphasize too much one side of it, but there are two pillars to our gospel one, the death and the crucifixion, but you can't have one without the other. And the most significant and important is the resurrection. Because without the resurrection, you have no new life. And this is what Peter was emphasizing. Too often the resurrection of Christ is just shared on Easter. And I need to be, when I have the opportunity and the Lord quickens me, is to speak about the power of His resurrection. It's not by coincidence that every message in this book is breathed about the resurrection. Think about what happened in this moment when you read through the book of Acts and all the people that came to him and lives that were changed and healings that were taking place. This message, this specific message turned people inside out, right side up. 
You had a group of people in the Roman Empire that were lethargic and indifferent. And this message shook the foundations. The resurrection of Christ. He is risen. So then this next little section is interesting to me because remember I said he had not quite yet understood from the Scriptures what all this meant. Now he gets into a section where we recognize that he's correlated the Old Testament to what has transpired and it began to speak to his spirit and the Holy Spirit gives us an interpretation of Scripture through Peter. This is verse 25. David said about him, he's still talking to the people. David said about him, and he's actually talking about Psalm 16, 8 and 11. I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. So at this moment, we see that he began to understand the Lord. In in Luke 24, it talks about this. The Spirit of God began to give them understanding of the Scriptures. Because when you read that, if you go back to Psalm 16, you think it's David talking about himself. But he's not. And the Spirit tells us this. He's saying, no, 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 no. This was Jesus speaking to the Father. You will not let your Holy One see decay. And this was how many years prior? Let's go on as he goes a little further explaining. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. So he was somewhere near the temple. Now think of him talking to these people. He goes over this psalm and he lays it all out. And he said, no, 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 it's not about David. He points to where his tomb is on Mount Zion. He said, no, no, David's up there. He's decaying. This is speaking of Christ. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this life. God has, um, God has, uh, I lost my spot. He was a prophet, knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. First sermon, Easter message. Every other sermon in the book of Acts, Easter message. All about life, all about resurrection. So what does all this mean? We tell the story and we walk away and we say, yep, Jesus rose again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I I did that with a few people today. But what does it mean for us? Well, there's a story in the next chapter that I think correlates. Peter and John are going to the temple. It's three in the afternoon. They're going up to pray. And they walk by, and there's this guy in there, and he's been an invalid, a paralytic his entire life. So think about that. Legs never used. You think of, you think of the atrophy. And people would place him there to ask for money. And so as they're walking in, he cries out, hey, 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 and he gets their attention, and he thinks they're going to give him money. Peter says, no, silver and gold I have none, but what I do have, I freely give you. It's a powerful story. Right? So that's where they're at. They heal him. He begins to come to his feet. He begins to walk around and he begins to dance and whatnot. And so it obviously draws attention and people are totally shocked at what was going on with this miraculous touch, this life that just had been extended to him. Now, let me read. So then this is what happened. Peter saw this. He said to them, this is Acts 3, 12. And then I jumble around a little bit just because there's a long period, a long piece to it. Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise Israelites? Why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and now and know was made strong. 
It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that he that has completely healed him, as you can all see. He totally gave credit to Christ. It was his resurrection power. I started today talking about the young man. Well, he's not so young. He's my age. In the hospital. And he's in a pretty precarious spot. And as the Lord kind of whispered to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I'm preparing for this. And I'm looking at Easter and resurrection and the power of new life. And I'm like, this is it. This is what brought Tyler Ortegas to life. Because he was a paralytic when he came in here. Eric Suarez was dead when he came in here. Nick Reynolds was dead when I came in here. I was begging. I was on the temple steps asking for money. Somebody help me. And I, what I wanted was something that I could touch. But he gave me, oh, so much more. Every single one of us. So as I thought about this gentleman laying in this hospital bed, knowing that unless the Lord touches this man in a way where this resurrection power begins to quicken his spirit, I don't know what's going to take place in his life. But see, that's the program. This message is the program. The life of Christ that is birthed into us, we believe and we walk in something totally different. Peter's life changed. He was the rock. All the way unto his death, he professed that not only the death, but the resurrection of Christ, because that is what brings about the change in people's life. As we believe, new life takes place. So the question for all of us is, do we believe this?